Being an Armenian, the land of the people will only come and have an hour. I'm more of those general law scandals, more than those who said. And then the professor of philosophy here and the director of the Global Institute for Advanced Study, which is sponsoring this event. This institute does typically ambitious multi year projects of an interdisciplinary nature with some both in the quality of human rights and neural computation, in the future of classical music. And we recently inaugurated this project on the denial of the Armenian genocide. What we aim to do is produce a book, uh, commissioned essays, um, experts worldwide, um, who will write on various aspects of this denial campaign. Now, uh, hundred. Uh, and at least 100 years old. Um, we're interested in the what, when, how, why uh, of this campaign, which has been so effective, such an effective campaign, that uh, one of the greatest crimes against humanity, which everybody at the time knew about, thought about, has simply been erased from people's memories. And this is a fact of great consequence not just because we should know what's true, but because, as people say, if you don't report this, if you don't hold the people responsible accountable, it's likely to repeat. And in fact, we're now seeing, I think, continuation of this genocide campaign, even led by the very same, in some sense, continuous sense, perpetrators. Um, and they can do this without fear of international recrimination and condemnation because they have so effectively erased this fact from people's memories. So it's very consequential, and we aim to understand it better. Um, please, come in. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, I will now turn things over to my esteemed colleague, Kathy Maladian, from Columbia University and the Library of Congress, who will introduce today's event. Thank you, Paul. Uh, a couple of very quick announcements to start with. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be later available uh, online. Uh, please set your phones to silence and please join us for a reception right after the event uh, on, on the sixth floor. Uh, and uh, so without further ado, I'd like to start with introducing our speaker. So the way we're going to proceed is uh, we're going to have Mark Monigonian uh, deliver his remarks. Uh, then uh, we will have uh, uh, Professor Bernard Mujolu uh, uh, offer her remarks, and then we'll open up for discussion. So, Mara Mamigunen is the Director of Academic Affairs of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, where he has worked since 1998. He's the co author of the volume Annotations for James Joyce's Ulysses, Oxford University Press 2022, with John, John Turner and Sam Slot. And is the co author of annotated editions of James Joyce's The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, uh, also with John Turner and Ulysses, uh, with John Turner and Sam Sloat. He has served as the editor of the Journal of Armenian Studies and the volume The Armenians of New England, the New Heritage Press 2004, and has published articles in Genocide Studies International, James Joyce Quarterly, The Armenian Review. Journal of Society for Armenian Studies and elsewhere. His chapter, Weaponizing the First Amendment, Denial of the Armenian Genocide in the U.S. Congress, is forthcoming in, actually, the book that came out, right? Uh, in Denial of Genocides in the 21st Century, edited by Nadoster Matosian. And our discussant is Professor Lerna Ekmosjol. She's an associate professor of history at MIT and the director of the Women's and Gender Studies program. He's a historian of the early Turkish Republic with particular focus on minorities. The first monograph, Recovering Armenia, the limits of belonging in post-genocide Turkey, came out from Stanford University Press in 2016. 
In 2006, she co-edited a volume in Turkish on the first five Armenian Ottoman Turkish feminists. Currently, she is collaborating with Dr. Musa Bilal of UCLA for a book on Ambitious Mary's project titled Feminism in Armenian, an Interpretive Anthology and Documentary Archive, Stanford University Press, forthcoming in 2024. So let's welcome Mark Monogonian. Thank you. Sorry, I have uh, my glasses here to open up the mall of optician's shop. <laughs> Just in case. So, the future of classical music. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank the NYU Global Institute for Advanced Study, and particularly and specifically, Achi Muradian and Paul Lossian for having me here tonight. To, uh, I want to thank Lee Bond for all of her kind assistance in making it possible to get here tonight, and the Clarinet Metro Loop for kindly agreeing to be the discussant tonight. Uh, this being April 24th, I want to remember in particular all the victims and all the survivors of the Armenian Genocide, including my grandmother, Johar Aslanyan Namagonian of Kasserik and your grandparents and great grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and everyone else. It's okay. That little time. <laughs> Thank you. That's our stubborn thanks, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. John Adams, almost 200 years after John Adams spoke those words, Hannah Arendt, in her 1967 essay, Truth and Politics, reflected on a problem she identified earlier than most. Quote, the extent to which unwelcome factual truths are tolerated in free countries, they are often unconsciously or consciously transformed into opinions, as though the fact of Germany's support of Hitler or of France's collapse before the German armies in 1940 or of Vatican policies during the Second World War were not a matter of historical record, but a matter of opinion. Denial, either of the Armenian genocide or of other events or phenomena, does not necessarily need to convince people to be affected. It inflicts sufficient damage by creating a spurious discussion that creates a haze of doubt around the facts. Facts may be stubborn, as Adam stated, but as Arendt understood, if you can confuse enough people about what the facts are, it is possible to reduce the set of facts to merely the status of opinion, or to employ a different phrase, as to reduce it to one narrative among others competing for legitimacy. The American civil rights leader, Ned Drevers, is credited with the saying, you can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. Edwards was murdered in 1963 by a member of the Ku Klux Klan. But the Ottoman Empire and subsequently the Republic of Turkey have tried and in some ways succeeded in having it both ways. First, they killed the Armenians, and then they tried to kill the idea that they had killed the Armenians. Turkey's protege state, Azerbaijan, has emulated its big brother, expunging, expunging the region of Nakhchivan of all evidence of Armenian existence, threatening Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, with annihilation while eradicating evidence of Armenia's presence in the region, and in effect, denying the existence of Armenia as such, systematically republishing primary sources with references to Armenia and Armenians removed or altered. Furthermore, beginning on December 12, 2022, Azerbaijan imposed a blockade on nagorno karabakh Artsakh, sealing off its sole connection to Armenia and thus the outside world, all while promoting the lie that the blockade is actually the work of Azerbaijani environmental activists. Turkey and Azerbaijan are often aided and abetted in their contrafactual efforts by scholars, journalists, and policy analysts 
who sometimes knowingly, sometimes ignorantly, repeat the counterfactual denialist assertions that emanate from those states, or whose presentations are shaped by denialist efforts, much as the pounding of the waves shapes a beach. As denial and the propagation of alternative facts takes its place at the center of contemporary life, it's increasingly important to understand how it works and what it seeks to accomplish. It is thus of such great importance that the NYU Global Institute for Advanced Study has inaugurated the widespread puzzling beliefs in Armenian genocide denial projects. In 2019, both the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate passed resolutions recognizing the Armenian genocide and, quote, rejecting efforts to enlist, engage, or otherwise associate the United States government with denial of the Armenian genocide or any other genocide. On April 24, 2021, U.S. President Joe Biden became the first president to issue a statement on Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day that actually employed the term, at least from the beginning of the paragraph. Thus, within a discussion that recognizes the Armenian Genocide, even within a discussion that recognizes the Armenian Genocide, the topic remains entrapped in a framework where a balance must be struck between two narratives. One he calls Turkish and one he calls Armenian. In fact, one is Turkish state propaganda and the other is the scholarly consensus. One notes, too, that the formation of this scholarly consensus has come about in no small part through the efforts of Armenians themselves, not to minimize the efforts of courageous Turkish scholars, too, but without the efforts of the Armenians themselves, the issue would have long since disappeared. But in fact, they have disappeared entirely from Rogan's account. Moving right along. Doesn't like the full screen share. Thank you. <laughs> Next section. On Gutbrod and David Wood's essay, Turkey will never recognize the Armenian genocide, is a remarkable exercise in moral hubris. And as the authors dispense their bromide and presume to lecture Armenians on how they should, quote, memory the past in an ethical manner. The authors, who are professors at Ilya State University in Tbilisi, Georgia, and Seton Hall University in New Jersey, respectively, proposed to address the moral dimensions of an Armenia-Turkey detente, warning that a focus on achieving justice alone through unilateral action or external arbitration may provide a sense of validation to victims, but it can also fuel resentment, sour relationships, and lead to future violence. They argued that the Armenian and Turkish governments should work to reframe the Armenian genocide and the wider suffering that accompanied the downfall of the Ottoman Empire as a shared history and even recommend that Washington could fund research into Turkish and Armenian sentiment on the Armenian genocide to explore the contours of belief in more depth to transcend the ongoing standoff. On one point, at least, I am in full agreement with the office. Turkey will likely never recognize the Armenian genocide, at least it is hard to imagine that day coming. I think they are mistaken, though, in asserting that the only point of international effort to gain recognition of the Armenian genocide is to compel Turkey to do likewise. Efforts to gain international recognition, while not necessarily an end in themselves, usefully highlight the absurdity of Turkey's denialist stance. <clears throat> Why is that useful? Because, and I find it simply incomprehensible that the authors do not mention this important fact even once, Turkey not only does not recognize the Armenian genocide, but it also actively, vehemently, and aggressively denies it. And not just within its own borders, but also abroad, wherever and whenever possible, in a multitude of ways, and using the considerable resources it has at its disposal. There is a significant body of scholarship as well, as well as general commentary dating back to the 1970s on the topic of Turkish denial of the Armenian Genocide. I hear there's even a project at New York University to study it. It, it's hard to believe that two serious-minded scholars could be unaware of this, or if aware, why they chose to omit mention of it. <laughs> Likewise, it is difficult to see how a discussion of how to commemorate the past in an ethical manner can occur without taking the issue of Turkey's denial into account. Such omissions and lapses do great harm to their credibility, uh, the, the credibility of their presentation. 
Furthermore, the authors fail to take into account the vast power discrepancy between the two nations or people, both historically and currently. Turkey, with its huge population and military capacity, has for some three decades imposed a blockade on Armenia. The tiny remaining Armenian population in Turkey has lived in constant fear of discrimination or violence for a century. And Ankara, at minimum, was Azerbaijan's indispensable ally and provider of weaponry for its war against the Armenians in 2020. These facts are not mentioned by the authors. While they rightly decry the petty triumphalism of Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev following the war, no mention is made of Ankara's own petty triumphalism. Could Broad and Wood call on Armenians and Turks, or perhaps Armenia and Turkey, since they do not seem to make a distinction, to reconcile? Reconciliation, I think, implies a restoration of friendly relations after a dispute. While historically there was not always an intractable state of bloody conflict between Armenians and Turks, neither was there a state of relations at an earlier time, say, prior to the Armenian genocide, which would be reasonable to expect Armenians to want to restore. The entire discourse of Turkish-Armenian reconciliation, as it has been framed mainly by European and American policymakers, and never more so than in Woodbrod and Wood's presentation, positively reeks of first world paternalism. As a white American, I would not have the temerity to call on Native Americans or African Americans to set aside seeking justice in order to reconcile with white Americans or to urge them to focus their efforts instead on highlighting the many good white people who oppose slavery, who oppose slavery or the annihilation of the indigenous, indigenous population. Such recommendations would be, one hopes, seen as what they are, attempts to solve problems by coercing a victim group into abandoning its rights. All too often, we've seen the language of reconciliation deployed in the service of denial by stronger parties and the use of a so-called reconciliation process as a tool to defer any proper recognition of or redress for historical crimes. An insistence on the fact of the Armenian genocide by scholars, by activists, by governments, is seen as counterproductive, indeed, if not an act of, uh, as an act of aggression. Reconciliation is deployed as one more weapon to beat back acknowledgement of the historical record and consequences that might arise from such an acknowledgement and a never-ending peace, a never-ending peace process, Freudian slip, and a never-ending process fosters the illusion of forward progress. This supposed reconciliation, we are meant to believe, like the dawning of the age of Aquarius, will usher in a new era of harmony and understanding. Sympathy and trust abounding, no more falsehoods or derisions, golden living dreams of vision. Let the sun shine in. <laughs> the, the dangling care of Turkish and Armenian reconciliation has become a version of the cruel ploy pithily articulated by Ralph Ellison to encapsulate the African-American experience in his novel, Invisible Man. Quote, to whom it may concern, keep this end boy running. Or as, or as it is said elsewhere in the book, please, hope him to death and keep him running. A secondary sense of reconciliation is the process of bringing into harmony two different ideas in such a way that they are compatible with each other. That end, we might ask, is there a way to reconcile the Turkish state narrative of the events of 1915 with the historical record on the Armenian genocide? Even a casual reading of Turkey's official historiography in the work of those who promoted abroad must lead to answering this question in the negative. The only way forward is for Turkey to enter into the world of historical facts rather than state-manufactured historical fiction. Goodbrot and Wood's recommendations, unfortunately, do not point in that direction. What's needed is an entirely new Turkish-Armenian relationship founded on the realities of history and based on equality that grants redress for previous wrongs to the maximum extent possible. This is not what Kuprov and Wood are advocating, nor does it appear to be a likely prospect given the political realities on the ground. Unfortunately, by calling for a redescription of history that various sides can live with, and suggesting that an inconvenient genocidal history can simply be reframed, they are granting Turkey license to continue its efforts to rewrite history and victimize Armenians. In each rock has two names, uh, Gayat, and I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce his first name, but I think it's Gayat Abdullahad, 
provides an uneven mixture of insightful commentary, tenuous arguments, and false equivalences about the Armenia Azerbaijan conflict. Painting with a broad brush, he states that, quote, in both Armenia and Azerbaijan, writers constructed an ethno national narrative that aspired to negate the existence of the other country, or at least assign it the role of newcomer in the region. The comparison and the equation that it suggests is fundamentally flawed. While some historians in Armenia indeed have written problematic ethno national narratives which warrant criticism, they have not, for example, systematically expunged references to Azerbaijan and Azerbaijanis from published historical sources, in stark contrast with Azerbaijani academicians who have excised Armenia and Armenians from such publications for decades, even as thousands of Armenian historical monuments have been destroyed within Azerbaijan. Criticism of the work of Armenian historians is certainly fair game and calls for specifics rather than generalities but the two cases are not comparable in any meaningful way. Presumably by way of advancing his critique, Abdullah states that Arme uh, Armenian writers pointed to Armenian churches and monasteries in Karabakh as proof of an interrupted presence in the area and dismissed the term Azerbaijan as a modern political label. But it's not only Armenian writers who have noted the ancient and uninterrupted Armenian presence in the area, as, as indicated by churches and it is not an ethno national assertion nor an opinion. It is simply a fact mm -hmm. of which any historian or expert on the region must surely be aware. Similarly, the, similarly, the use of the name Azerbaijan for the area comprising the current day state of that name, as opposed to the region of Iran south of the Araks River, does not predate 1918. It is, this is essentially a historically accurate statement, whether or not it is also uttered by nationalists. Abdullah rightly identifies as specious the elaborate and preposterous fiction of Azerbaijani historians that modern Armenians, quote, had erased ancient inscriptions and claimed monuments as their own. Yet the conclusion he draws that, quote, two people could look at the same building and see in it what they wanted to see, unquote is a curious and unhelpful equating of, or inability to distinguish between, reality and fantasy. Surely there's a difference between, between Armenians or non-Armenians looking at, say, Ganbasar Cathedral and adopt, identifying it as an Armenian church, and Azerbaijani assertion that it is actually a Caucasian Albanian and thus proto-Azerbaijani edifice. There's a difference there. Finally, Azulahad and one of his sources, analyst Phil Gamalgelian, presents a skewed view of the Armenia Turkey Azerbaijan relationship. Azulahad writes At a time when Turkey itself was at last taking steps to acknowledge this part of its history, decriminalizing discussion of the genocide, allowing books to be published, addressing all aspects of the late Ottoman period, holding commemorations in Istanbul and Ankara, it was in Azerbaijan that denialism flourished. It's true that genocide denialism in Azerbaijan has flourished. It goes hand in glove with the overall negation of any and all things related to Armenians. It is, however, insupportable to say that Turkey, as a state or as a nation, was taking steps to acknowledge this part of its history. It is indeed a form of denial itself to say, as Abdullah does, that more recently, however, Turkey returned to a denialist position. Let's be clear, Turkey has never left its denialist position. Full stop. Additionally, Kamalgalian refers to the dangerous, quote, Armenian nationalist narrative that Azerbaijan and Turkey were one and the same, unquote. But of course, it is not Armenian nationalists who have formulated the idea of Turkey and Azerbaijan as one nation and two states. It is Azerbaijan and Turkey who have devised and embraced this description. It is Azerbaijan and Turkey who put it into practice during the 44 day war of 2020 and continue to do so today. It was Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev who jointly celebrated the war's outcome, which Aliyev called, quote, an example of our unity, our brotherhood. Abdullah is right to look critically at how facts are used to advance various political and perhaps nationalistic agendas, be they Armenian or Azerbaijani. But at key moments, he fails to differentiate fact from fiction presumably out of a desire to present a balanced picture. All we are allowed to see are two sides with deeply entrenched positions, narratives, views, opinions. 
but the facts are is seemingly beside the point or else unknowable. Unpacking the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict requires identifying the harmful role, role played by nationalist narratives, yes, but the process is not aided by placing facts and fiction on the same footing. Each rock may have two names, but one side calls a rock a rock, and the other insists that the rock is actually a tree. Can we not agree where the problem lies? There seems little doubt that Azerbaijan, emboldened by its military victory and fueled by petrodollars, will increasingly seek to purchase the kind of academic semi-credibility that Turkey has for decades sought through the cultivation of scholars willing to present, present its state narrative as historical fact, or at least worthy of consideration as such. This is not to suggest that such efforts have not been made before now. Most notorious, perhaps, was Harvard's Caspian Studies program. Uh, in the 1990s, funded through a $1 million grant from the U.S. Azerbaijan Chamber of Commerce and a consortium of gas and oil companies led by Exxon, Mobil, and Chevron, troop merchants, one and all, all of which had commercial interests in the region. In late 2022, an ostensibly scholarly book appeared, The Nagorno-Karabakh Conflict, Historical and Political Perspectives, edited by M. Hakan Yavuz and Michael M. Gunther. Considerations of space and time preclude a lengthy discussion of the contributions of Yavuz and Gunter to the denial of the Armenian genocide. I have already done so elsewhere, as have others. Suffice it to say, they have long been in the forefront of efforts to conjure an academic controversy about the events of 1915. The editors provide a preemptive apologia as a preface, stating their deep sensitivity to the fact that the subject of the book is, quote, susceptible to the perception of bias and the arousal of strong feelings on both sides. Oh, we're good. I just lost the screen. That's all. Uh, not only should bias be avoided, but so too is mere perception, if at all possible. This is difficult because people, no matter how unbiased, can be perceived by others as being on one side or the other. Thus, the editors recognize that this is a subject that gives rise to strong feelings on both sides. They have done all they can to be even-handed. Although they recognize that with some people, perceptions of bias might still exist, they feel that any such views are ill-founded. Their brief preface could have been even briefer still. Aviat Emsel. It will have to be the task of other writers and reviewers to unpack the historical distortions larded into the 452 pages of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, or to unravel the process by which it was published by Rutledge, a, a reasonably respectable publisher. For the purposes of this discussion, it will be enough to note that the book's primary task of presenting an account of the, of the, of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict that aligns with Baku's preferred narrative is fully compatible with the long-standing efforts of the editors and at least some of the authors to cast all possible doubt on the Armenian genocide. The book is replete with references to genocide in scare quotes, the so-called Armenian genocide, genocide allegations, claims of genocide, and so on, which are a natural and synergistic companion to the book's main objective. Let me head towards a conclusion. Not long ago, I encountered an incisive commentary on Turkey's denial of the Armenian genocide. I would like to quote it at some length. The defense made by the Turkish government in the Armenian massacres reminds me very much of an old Jewish story. Two Jewish women brought their dispute before an old rabbi about a kettle plaintiff could not get back from defendant, to which defendant said, first, she knew of no such kettle. Second, she had returned it long ago. And third, the kettle was not worth speaking of being a broken one. The Turkish government claims, first, there were no such things as the Armenian massacres. Second, the massacres had been in every place only a local and unofficial character, no orders having been issued by the government. And third, the government orders were issued only in self-defense and had the approval of their enlightened ally, the Germans. The author of uh, the author's name is Aaron Aronson. He was a botanist, Zionist, and member of the Dealey Spy Network in Palestine during World War I. He died in 1919. His words were written in 1916. That is to say, the torturous and self-implicating self-contradictions of Turkey's denial were already painfully obvious in 1916 when the genocide was still taking place. The old Jewish story that Aronson tells is a variation on a joke reported by Freud 
in his 1905 wit and its relation to the unconscious. The black humor of Turkey's denial of the Armenian genocide, a long running act now in its second century, has always followed its own peculiar kettle logic, a logic that prevailed in all denialist projects like this one. Today, Turkey's kettle logic might go something like this A, there was no Armenian genocide. B, what happened was very sad and it was not ordered by the government. C, anyway, the Armenians were disloyal and brought it on themselves. Or D, whatever did or didn't happen wasn't a crime. Or E, something if something did happen, it was tragic, but you can't call it genocide because it has never been adjudicated in a court of international law. Or F, actually the Armenians committed genocide against the Turks, and so on, perhaps all the way to Z and beyond. Armenian has 38 letters, you can go further. The passage of the century has led to the development of a wider range of choices, but the kettle logic remains intact. A notion that Turkey and its loyal or at least well-funded friends in politics, lobbying, academia, and other profitable, profitable pursuits were prepared to accept the consensus of the facts on the Armenian genocide and to drop the tiresome and expensive efforts to foment denial has been, to say the least, overly optimistic. Like many other mega industries, the denial business has been declared too big to fail. Turkey and those who support it have invested too much for too long, and there are too many people on the payroll to just close shop. The denial business is booming in Baku, also, where there seems to be no contradiction to assert that the so called Armenians living in the Grono Karabakh, if not those in the Armenian Republic itself, are not Armenians at all, but some sort of crypto Caucasian Albanians, and that so called Armenian monuments in Artsakh are actually. Albanian, if not those also in Armenia, and into Western Armenia, as far as Lake Van. So it stands to reason, in finger quotes, that the rich heritage of Armenian monuments that Azerbaijan insists never existed in Nakhchivan must also have been Caucasian Albanian, and thus proto Azerbaijani. And so one wonders why they had to be eradicated, especially if they never existed in the first place. F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote that the first that the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. So, do we do? <laughs> there is a famous and perhaps apocryphal story about French Prime Minister George Clemenceau, who, when asked what future historians will think about the problem of who was responsible for starting World War I, is said to have responded. This I don't know, but I know for certain they will not say Belgium invaded Germany. Commenting on this Clemenceau anecdote, Anna Arendt wrote that, quote, considerably more than the whims of historians would be needed to eliminate from the record the fact that on the night of August 4th, 1914, German troops crossed the frontier of Belgium would require no less than a power monopoly over the entire civilized world. But such a power monopoly is far from being inconceivable, and it is not difficult to imagine what the fate of factual truth would be if power interests, national or social, had the last say in these matters. Echoing John Adams, she writes, facts assert themselves by being stubborn, and their fragility is oddly combined with great resiliency. Amen to that. But facts need help to assert themselves. Within Turkey and Azerbaijan, the kind of power monopoly Arendt finds far from being inconceivable, is a reality. Today, Turkey and their Ireland continue their well-funded efforts to overwrite the historical record with their alternative fact account of the Ottoman extermination of the Armenians, of the history of Artsakh, the Brno Karabakh, and of the region generally. Although their efforts are widely rejected in most, but not, alas, all, international academic circles, in the less rigorous realms of journalism and think tanks, their efforts are far more profitable. With Armenia in a position of abject vulnerability as a result of the 44 day war and the subsequent Azeri incursion into Armenia proper, it's clear that powerful forces are lining up to dictate both Armenia's future and its past. Thank you. So much, Mark. Thank you, Hachi and Paul, for inviting me. It's such an honor to be here today, especially and in being in conversation with Mark. Um, okay, I'll keep my comments to 
maximum the maximum 15 minutes after which we'll open it up to the to the audience um i would I'll, i'm going to make two points and i have four questions i would like to start with an obvious though sometimes overlooked point which is that doing this kind of research is difficult and that it is extremely difficult most likely many of us in the room already feel the 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 difficulties of really hearing people lie about what we already know is to be a fact, maybe. Uh, but it takes, I would like to underline that it takes an emotional toll to study genocide perpetrators and following the words of the words of those who defend the perpetrators by denying the genocide, because we know if if they were supporting the uh, perpetrators and it does come with an emotional and maybe even an intellectual price what marxist studies is the scenario in which lying passes as either truth or opinion and therefore it provided a legitimate academic and political platform some have called the intellectual denial of the genocide its last stage we're probably very familiar with this um, Stage uh, definition. However, scholars recently, like Henry Perio, alerted us to the dangers of stage theory and argued convincingly that since there is no permanent or telos of genocide, genocides actually don't even end. And if there ever is a near end, it would be the consolidation of stolen territory of the victims. That's the confiscation turning into a wholesale final, somewhat uh, irrevocable um, consolidation. Mark's work allows us to understand the connection between these two processes, that denial and consolidation are uh, mutually constitutive in a way, that they continue denial enables the consequences of genocide to be as permanent and as irrevocable as possible. While it's difficult for anyone to work on perpetrators' denialists to decode and expose their lies, I would like to emphasize that it's especially demanding for the descendants of the survivors. Mark and I are like most of the audience, most likely, I don't know it, but probably. Mark and I both belong to this group. Denialism hits us differently because it hits a core that's vulnerable and fragile. It's also persistent and resistant, and it is what makes us feel empowered and continue fighting for justice and reparation. Most of us most likely fight a lot of anxiety because of that fragile core. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that we embody our research differently and more deeply. The intergenerational transmission of the memory of the massacres and deportation is so tangible and real that it is effectively transmitted even when no words are uttered in our childhood about what has happened to our parents, grandparents, and great grandparents. This is illustrated most recently in the memoir of an NYU professor, Eberhard Junian, which is brilliantly titled The Unspoken as Heritage. All this to say, Mark. Had, what, had, what Mark had been doing for years in chasing the denialist discourse in scholarly and semi-scholarly publications is nothing short of courageous, and I would like to sincerely thank him for taking that up. I also want to emphasize that especially for the descendants, facts are stubborn things. And this reminds me of how Mark even started the whole event, because we know about the facts from our intimate family histories. This is where the power of the grandma lies. Everyone believes their grandmother. <laughs> and this they cannot take away from us. And that's why we actually try so hard to pass these memories on. And I, that's why we should also pass the, the ways that we decode denial to the next generation as well. My second point, Mark, uh, I think for me in this whole uh, conversation, the, the talk, the discussion of reconciliation, the discourse of reconciliation is the, I think it's the strongest 
I find it to be superb. As the historian of Armenian Turkish relations, I especially appreciate uh, Mark's emphasis that if reconciliation means restoring a relationship to the Restoring a relationship to its pre-conflict state, there was no such relationship even before the genocide that Armenians and mass would like to revert back, given that Armenians were colonized by the Ottoman Turks for about 600 years. This doesn't mean that a lot of Armenians were part of the Ottoman state and benefited from it. And for some of them, of course, it would be better to have that kind of a relationship. However, however hierarchical it might have been. But in general, uh, why, why would we want to go back to those times? I'm quite aware of the huge differences, obviously, between uh, the British and French colonization of Africa and Ottoman colonization of non turkish land. But it is not unreasonable for at least the sake of analogy to think of Armenians as Blacks in the US. Who, and, and kind of, I'm taking this cue from uh, Mark's analogy of, of maybe how like, we wouldn't dare to ask here as white Americans now to, to basically to, to put, to put for the Blacks to kind of like their, their um, now, not make a huge deal, not lying about their complaints about the past, about the past, for the sake of keeping a peaceful present. So ask Blacks in the United States to stop whining about the past and be grateful for all the DI matters. We know they're also the ones who are the 1619 project. They're against the project. They also ban books. They create alternative facts and our expertise. The contemporary US rising extremist discourse is not that different from what Mark calls poster denial of the Armenian genocide. We are living in a denial era in the United States as well for the spread of ignorance. With that, I'd like to move to my questions now. Which is the first one is about the softer version of denial, British denial. Why Mark do you think softer denial is now more effective? You allude to it in the context of Sinan Uyan's Carnegie Europe series that a shift happened in Turkey's official discourse, and that rather than outright denial, there is now a kind of softer denial. This reminds me of Michael Bosgarian's superb review of Turkish journalist Edith Tamar Kran's 2010 book, Deep Mountain, Across the Turkish Armenian Divide, where Bojkarian is a great piece where he diagnosed the change already in, in this 2010 book as, I quote, genocide denial unabashed to genocide denial right in non-academic writing. In connection with that, I myself have been observing that in some scholarly publications produced by real legitimate actors in scholarly journals or even semi scholarly legitimate platforms, like the podcast series that you mentioned on the review of books, a, a new trend emerged. People calling the event the Armenian Genocide. But then, like, like in the podcast, but I do see it in the scholarship as well, but then either manipulating basic facts or engaging in apologia, what we might call what about them. I have come to call this trend crypto denialism very closely. Do you think, Mark, that what you are calling soft denialism in official and semi official circles is, is connected to those scholarly or semi scholarly? Crypto denialism, and I'm sure it is, but in what ways? Like, what's making it pass? Why there, is, there seems to be like a card now, Armenian genocide card. If you use it, it can be, even if you want to, and even though they are not necessarily uh, supported with evidence. Um, question number two. This is factual, but I, I'm curious about this. The two, uh, so you provide the, uh, um, an explanation of where Sinan Uyan comes from, right? Like that he, he has his foreign service background, it's kind of like his job, even though Carnegie Mellon, uh, Carnegie Foundation doesn't seem to, I mean, I'm not sure what their politics is about this, but uh, how about the other two cases that you bring? So Hans was 
good pros and David Wood. Yes, they are professors, so, but what makes them do you think, or do you know anything that at this point they rise to the occasion to share their ideas and come up with advice? And the same is true for Abdul Ahad as well. But what's the motivation? What's the entitlement? What are they after? Are they connected to any group that you could you could uh, find? Mm. Question number three. Yes, uh, Mark just said that Turkey will likely never recognize the Armenian genocide, and that at least it's hard to imagine that they come. So I was wondering. Because I don't, I did not want to be resisted. I can't imagine a scenario where Turkey will recognize the Armenian genocide, but will do it in such a symbolic way that it will kind of preempt or it will try to preempt uh, reparations, uh, restitution, all those kind of like restorative justice measures. So, do you think this is possible? And I'm, I'm asking this because I know you were part of the organizing committee of the recent conference that was held at the Promised Armenian Institute at UCLA on the Armenian Genocide Restitution in the post-recognition era. So maybe you can bring this perspective from that conference. I mean, what, yes, we know by the way. So there are some consequences to the American recognition. How do we, like, if you were a what would you do now to to reconcile a, a version of history where Armenians will, Armenians will get their keyword, but you don't need to get anything back to them? Question number four, and this is the last one. Um, regarding the Azerbaijani efforts to cultivate semi credibility by installing academic centers in the highly prestigious universities such as Oxford and Harvard. Uh, the question is what is to be done? What is the best way do you think we can deal with this trend? But is, I mean, it's always a question when we think about denialists. Right, like what is the best way? Do we ignore them and we don't delegate them to the, to the public's eye? We don't take them as interlocutors, or um, or do we try to do we engage in the battle of even endowing more academic centers, more shares in Armenian studies, so that we dilute the work of their work or provide kind of odd alternative scholarly versions for actual facts. Um, but in general, I think this is this is great work. I'm very thankful that you're doing it. And I really hope that one day you will write one big, big book about this. That will be the Bible denialism. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Clarence. Uh, uh, hearing your your comments and thoughts and insights, you know, it's it makes you feel to uh, to paraphrase the character of uh, Neil Lamont from uh, uh, Singing in the Rain. It makes you, makes one feel as if one's efforts haven't been in vain for nothing. <laughs> in other words, what I'm trying to say is when you spend this many years looking at as such an unpleasant subject, it, it's it's uh, encouraging and welcome to see serious people taking taking the issues seriously. Because frankly, uh, 10 years ago or more, I don't think that was so much the case. There was an awful lot of, eh, just ignore them. It'll go away. Or everybody knows that it's a lot of crap. I don't think everybody knows that actually. So uh, to, to address your, your excellent questions as best I can, uh, I was thinking about that review that you mentioned, the Godkarian review of Ejitem El Quran's book, uh, actually while I was writing this. Uh, it is it is a very good piece on denial of light, yes. And and why or how does it is denial like is softer denial effective? Um, I think it is pretty effective, and it doesn't mean 
you know, denial, hard denial, denial, heavy denial, as in, it's not an either or situation. And, and, but the existence of softer denial in the context of harder denial looks so reasonable to many people that I think it benefits from, from being sort of uh, a less bad cop in a, it's not a good cop, bad cop situation. It's a bad cop, not quite as bad cop uh, scenario where, where the, the uh, soft denial strikes many people who encounter it, uh, again, presuming they are not deeply immersed in, in, in the subject matter as eminently reasonable. And frankly, it is the, you know, people who insist on, uh, you know, calling it, uh, calling, calling it genocide and things like that, who are construed as unreasonable and kind of fanatical. Uh, and, and, and I think it, the, the soft denial plays the, I'm just trying to be reasonable card very effectively in, in many cases. Uh, the other writers uh, that I talked about, why, why they took this pack in their pieces, Coop, Rotten, Wood, I have no earthly idea. Uh, I attended a webinar given by one of them around the time that that article came out um, and to try to understand better. I didn't understand better. Um, I think I, I'm willing to take them at their word that they think they really gained some genuine insights into this situation that I don't think they actually have any insights into at all. It may be that uh, they have nefarious uh, intentions. I have no idea, not for me to say. I, I, I've given up trying to peer into the souls of people who write this stuff. I just read it and, and try to think about it. Uh, likewise, the Abdullah Had, who write, who's a uh, contributing writer for the London Review of Books. Um, I subscribe to the London Review of Books. Uh, he writes things on all sorts of subjects. And for whatever reason, I do not know why, how these decisions are made. Uh, the editors assigned him to write about the Nagorno Karabakh conflict. I don't have any reason to believe he has an agenda, nor do I have any reason to believe he has any particular uh, background in the subject. And this is what we got. Um, Turkey recognition without consequences. Yes, that seems like a possibility. Uh, I, I'd actually thought it might have happened before now in some sense, since, since before 2015, maybe as a preemptive way of saying, okay, we, re we recognize this, and that's the end of it. But I don't think they can, because again, I think they're, they're, uh, the, the state and all that accompanies the state and supports the state is so deeply, deeply invested in it that I don't know that they can even do a token recognition without any consequences at this stage because there would be, even if there are no reparational, restitutional consequences, there would be other forms of consequences for that kind of admission, at least theoretically. I, I don't know. Um, Azerbaijan and academia. What to do? Uh, we should pay attention. That would be a good start. Uh, I'm a, I fear that we, that the collective we, haven't been paying too much attention up until now. Uh, uh, that these efforts were not taken entirely seriously. Uh, even today, with the the establishment of of this center, the Ganjami Center at Oxford, which I talk about in a longer version of this talk, which is going to be coming out in in Ajik's old forum, the Armenian Weekly uh, uh, magazine in, in, in a few days. Uh, I do talk about the Oxford Center. Um, I think that Azerbaijan has learned the lesson that, that buying uh, friendly and, and nice uh, scholarship that, that speaks well of, of the country and its position, even if it doesn't explicitly support anti-Armenian positions, is a good investment. Uh, we cannot, again, we cannot uh, establish enough shares or centers to outspend them. Uh, I don't believe the other thing that I've been told all these years is that, hey, in the free marketplace of ideas, 
Good ideas will prevail and bad ideas will fall by the wayside. I would love to believe that that's the case, uh, just as I would love to believe, you know, that the the little hardware store on the corner is going to, uh, you know, put Home Depot out of business. But that's probably not going to happen either, uh, and for the same reason. So uh, I think we need to be more attentive. Of course, we need to do create more good and better scholarship, but not to think that that alone is going to be the thing that that uh, that prevails in the end, because it's it it will not on its own, but it sure is a necessary uh, condition for anything. Else thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Verlan. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions. Uh, Paul, I don't have to study. No, no, but please go ahead. I wanted to know, learn asked why is it that uh, the softer denial become seen to be more effective? And the answer was quite plausibly that it seems more reasonable. And why does it be seen more reasonable? The explanation there, I think, is obvious. And that is that for the past 30, 40 years, there's been a huge increase in the amount of serious scholarly work on the And it's no longer ghettoized. So it's not only Ar Armenian scholars who are doing this work. And in, at least in the academic world, this is now spread to the point where you would make a fool of yourself you denied certain very basic things. So you have to resort to softer denial in order not to look like a total idiot. But that also answers the question, will Turkey ever recognize this? The thing is, we are on that path. The more the facts are disseminated, it becomes impossible to say ridiculous things, the more those options get closed off. So it's not, it's not that it's around the corner because other things have to take place, but I think it's on that path. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're taking an arc of the universe look at things, then probably yes. Uh, if we're looking at in any of our lifetimes, I think probably no. And I think, uh, uh, which I mentioned in again in the longer paper, but not in this, the work of Jennifer Dixon on on uh, Turkey's denialist discord and its ability to adjust, pivot, accommodate. Uh, move in a direction that looks more more reasonable and more open to acknowledgement but actually uh in, is re-entrenching at, at the same time and in some ways strengthening I, it's valuable work very important all right um well, thank you both again uh, it was a wonderful uh, presentation i just wanted to uh piggyback off of uh Lena's question uh, to which you responded that you uh, try not to go into the minds of the people who write these types of things anymore. But um, if you were to, uh, I guess, attempt to uh, guess what uh, the uh, what what the in the context of the genocide being acknowledged at least in the United States uh, and these basic facts that. Uh, uh, Dr. Bogosian just mentioned are no longer easy to just disregard completely. You know, what would be the direction, you know, of this soft denialism or crypto denialism uh, be if, 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 I mean, in some way or another, we're going to have to face this, right? So if facing it from an informed uh, perspective, uh, perhaps there were friends in the past or analogous situations with uh, other denialism campaigns. I don't know if there's any research been done or comparative literature between, let's say, um, Holocaust denialism or or the discourse uh, about ongoing, um, you know, ethnic cleansing or genocides, you know, that, that that we can use to to guide our response and reaction as to what might be coming. Thank you. Uh, I would like to think so, but I think denial studies in this sense is still fairly in its infancy in a, in a lot of respects. Uh, and I think the study of Armenian genocide denial is, is in a lot of ways, in I think anyway, in, in, in the forefront of, of a lot of this, maybe because the denial is so has been going on for so long. Uh, obviously there's been 
a great deal done on the Holocaust denials. And it's instructive, but also, I think, very different in a lot of ways, not least because there isn't a uh, German state that is sanctioning, funding, exporting, generating this, 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 this denial. Um, I think Paul is quite right that the scholarship, as the scholarship uh, widens and deepens, the, the areas that can be denied, some areas do get closed off. Although, you know, like whack a mole style, oftentimes you think, well, that one's done. We won't be hearing about that one anymore. And then, oh, well, that, that one's back. Uh, it's extremely resilient. Uh, this this denial. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know where it's going. And I didn't answer Lerner's, one of Lerner's questions uh, about the the restitution conference, which really didn't bear on this. I guess maybe that's why I passed over. It was more focused on legal avenues for pursuing, particularly in in this country or in in, in other countries, restitution. You know, or or property, or or you know, movable property, or real estate, um, as opposed to restitution from the Turkish thing. I'm sorry, that's not a good answer to your question because I don't know that I have it. Yes, Ida. Um, I want. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Number one, thank you, by the way, Dana and Mark, uh, for for and also for the. Uh, thank you, Ida. Uh, did not really get, did did he? At, at any point in that piece that he wrote, did he give any disclaimers about his own family? Of his family? Yeah. Mm, I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to read three tweets from uh, 2021. I remembered, like, all of a sudden that he wrote about this. Uh -huh. So this is in 4-25-21, so one day after today, basically, in 21. He's responding to somebody who's basically saying that Muslims also did suffer in Van. So my grandmother, this is Sinan, my grandmother hailed from Van. She got orphaned at the age of five. Both parents massacred by Armenian militia in 1915. She had to be sent to an orphanage in Istanbul. She attended a girls' school and became one of the first school teachers of the Young Republic. The reason why Turkish people are reactive to Western pontification about the events of 1915 is that these statements are singularly focused on the fate of Christian Armenians and include no empathy with the Muslim Turks who also perished in great numbers. This doesn't mean that we should compete on the scale of personal tragedies. On the contrary, we should all be more sincere in recognizing the tragedies that befell all those people, particularly Armenians, definitely, but not exclusively. But this is basically where it's coming from. Having said that, I just want to do a little bit of sort of soul searching towards the future. And I want I wonder what you all think, not just Mark, all historians in this in this sort of room. I'm sure some of you heard about um, AGI, artificial intelligence, chat GPT. So I don't know where you're seeing. Uh, I don't know where you're seeing the sort of the the, the 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 actual business of historianship ten years from now or twenty years from now. Uh, given that you know, uh, ChatGPT has been trained on mostly social media data sets, Twitter particularly, but also other sort of data sets from all around. Um, and uh, on the way in, I checked something which I should have had done earlier, and you know, up with today. Uh, somebody asked about, you know, Armenian genocide uh, in this uh, Dan mode, which, which is basically do anything now. Because chat GPT is such that you can jailbreak. Chat GPT is very politically correct, but you can jailbreak chat GPT. In other words, you can have chat GPT to deny Holocaust if you know how to ask the question, you know, but normally if you ask whether Holocaust happened, chat GPT is very, very politically correct and it's not going to deny anything. But there is a DA, DAN mode. So given all this sort of new territory, where do you think we're gonna end in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when machines write history and not human beings anymore? I think it's time to think about it because 
given the training data sets and whatnot that is at this point, I don't know whether there's any any politics or any any political organization or any organization for that matter involved in training data sets aware of what where we're going through 10 years from now, 20 years from now. I'll be in the hole in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that at least I'm covering. Uh, but um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone. And uh, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, to the point about uh, surely the experts know this is one of the problems of our community, our median community, outside of its academic circles. If we speak to big funds, people representing the big funds, organizations, and such. Um, oh, this is what you academics do. You know, when you have a conversation and there's three properly structured sentences, oh, it's an academic discussion. I don't want to get into that. Yeah. But the problem is that we are very much underfunded. The Armenian academic, bigger community globally, right? And clearly we're not competing with Home Depot, to your analogy. As an economist, this whole free market fair, fair tale is it's just that, okay? It doesn't work. So, but what happens is that if there's just a little bit of funding that is spread more democratically involving postdocs, involving students, chair, uh, endowed chairs, it falls on a fertile ground, right? Because it, it doubles with the efforts that people are doing already involuntarily. It's a brainstorm question. How do we actually get those funds, wherever they are, whatever they are, but within their to actually commit to broadening the uh, the academic uh, Armenian scholarship and not just specifically relating to the uh, in other words, they, they see Armenian genocide okay we fund this but they see uh, studying the economic consequences of 1915 what is this um something broader like that open question but just your thoughts because you're more involved with uh, in higher level conversations first of all and I don't want to Appear that I'm sucking up to my hosts here, but it's no small thing that that here at NYU there's a, a project that has been started focusing on Armenian genocide denial. Um, you know, it's not like there is an Armenian studies program at NYU. So um, you know that that's fantastic. It's the first thing of its kind ever anywhere, I believe. Um, as to the larger issue of spending money on scholarship uh, in, in general. Yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> it sounds like it's an immodest thing to bring up, but no, it's not it, really. You're in New York, so you can speak up. <laughs> I, mean, it, I, I work for an institution that, that this is what we try to do within our within our means. And, and, you know, without wishing to in any way signal ungratitude or ingratitude to, to people who generously give money to our organization or any other organizations, it's harder to get people to give money for an academic program or to fund scholarship for scholars than it is to get them to give money for, you know, a tangible item like like a brick and mortar building or or what have you. It's with their name on it. It's just it, and yeah. I mean, give money for scholarship, put your name on it. God bless you. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it happens all over the place. The, the so-and-so program, the so-and-so chair. I mean, these things happen. Uh, and there are resources. I still don't believe that this is, in the end, a question of resources, because even if all the resources were deployed, it, the imbalance is still so vast. I don't think it can be... Uh, surmounted that way, but we could do better. Yes, indeed. And I didn't want to ignore Ida's uh, point about AI because, well, I know exactly this much about the subject, even though it's on the front page of the newspaper every freaking day. Uh, I don't tend to read those articles. and But I, of course, when, what I have read, I think, how is this going to affect genocide denial? Because that's unfortunately the way my brain works at this point. And I, I assume it's going to affect it in terrible ways that we're all going to, you know, uh, have to deal with. But I don't know what that's going to look like. I assume it will be bad. <laughs> yeah, someone could be looking into it a little bit more, a bit more nuanced than I. <laughs> uh, question to you, Mark. In your research, obviously the 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 transition from hard denial to soft denial. Uh, was there 
somebody you identified as the architect of the concept of soft denial? Is there going to be a, a smoking gun one they will be able to point to and, and say, aha, that's when this happened and this was the person responsible for that? Uh, the smoking gun. Uh, that's a really good question. Let me first make clear. I don't think that it hasn't been exactly a transition from our denial to soft denial because that would suggest that our denial has gone away. It totally still exists. And soft denials need it to continue to exist to, to look like the more reasonable option. Um, I think it sort of started maybe in the 80s, at least in this country. Uh, and, and to my knowledge, based on what, what I've read and, and researched, one of the architects of it in, in this country was, was the uh, was at the ambassador um, Shukurela got. Whether he was the person conceiving it or simply carrying it out, I know not. But on his watch, starting in the early 80s, um, and I've written about this elsewhere, Turkey began investing in academic, uh, you know, cre in creating an academic body of, you know, scholarly denial work. Uh, and, and I think there was a realization that we're losing the hard denial war. We need to get more sophisticated. And it took a while, but they did. Wasn't it the tobacco? Your tobacco? Oh, well, I mean, I'm I'm sorry. I'm thinking specifically of the Turkish case. But yes, the, the whole concept of, of denial by creating doubt as opposed to outright denial is, is not unique to and was not invented by by Turkey and its supporters, I've talked about uh, the, the uh, analogy with, with tobacco denial, which goes back to the 1950s. Uh, the oil industry has engaged in similar pursuits where you create <coughs> scholarship and research that looks like it's promoting an actual inquiry, inquiry but is actually promoting your perspective. All right, let's, uh, because of time, uh, let's conclude, but there will be an opportunity to continue the conversation upstairs. So let's uh, join us for a reception on the sixth floor, is it? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lerna. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.